You are. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have restarted recordings. The Augur call on February 19th, Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, we have a demo of our Docker Compose installation uh, today. And also, uh, Georg has a question to start things off with. Yes, so here I put in the minutes uh, text that I wrote for the Chaos Weekly newsletter. Oh, can you um go ahead and paste that to the chat for us? Oh, the minutes? Yeah, GD Carter. Just so. There you go. There you go, always helpful. Um, so I highlighted um, yellow. And I just saw, uh, I, I wasn't at the meeting yesterday, unfortunately, but I saw uh, that you have Docker Compose ready and you're doing the demo today. Just yeah. wanted to ask where I should link this to. The, um, oh, the, like the, right. So uh, let me find, no, it's not it. Is this it? Yes, okay, so um, that link that I just pasted in there, uh, Georg, is the link to the documentation for how to get started with the Docker stuff using Augur. Um, if you want, I can also give you a link specifically to um, like the page that has the images on Docker Hub or uh, the compose files themselves. But I figured the documentation would probably be the, make the most sense to start with. Yes, I will update the link in here to point to the documentation. That is what I couldn't find. When I went to the Augur um, docs and I just searched for <coughs> Docker, I didn't see anything. Yeah, right. it's, in the, it's in the Docker branch. Uh, we mm -hmm. haven't merged it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I had to make a new version. I had to deploy the Docker version of the docs to get that up. But um, yeah, that's why you didn't see it. Okay, I will thank you for editing the text, Sean. I will put, copy paste it back into my template and then post the Chaos Weekly to the mailing list. Thank you so much. Oh That's yeah, need it. thank you very much, Georg. Oh, my pleasure. You have a good day. I need to head out, unfortunately. All right. Yep. Yeah, no right. problem. Sounds have good. Get there. Bye. 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 All right. It's back to us. All right. And um, do we have any expected participants? Um, we have promoted it pretty heavily, and we also don't have, we haven't promoted it heavily, uh, so we'll probably do a Docker demo again next week. Mm -hmm. And we're probably looking to change the time. So maybe, Carter, we could just start by seeing if we can find a time that uh, might work for all of us. Uh, Mike to me. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Um, I'm free 12 to 4 on Wednesdays. All right. So we need to find a time, uh, ideally earlier in the morning. When did we switch the evolution meeting to, Carter? Um, well, yesterday you uh, asked if we could switch it to 9 on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and I can only do Wednesday because I have class at 9.30 on Thursday. All right. So, so it's uh, not it's not my favorite time, but because I you and I are the same way. We're both more productive in the mornings, but yeah, it's not really I hate the time. Way around it. I hate the time also. Um, yeah, Tuesdays and Thursdays you're booked at nine. Yeah, here. Uh, let me share are my. Are you booked at nine or book at ten? So I'm sharing my calendar, um, so you can see what all I've got. Um. So I'm booked at 9.30 until 10.45. Um, on Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. So Wednesday, you could do. This is also um, an atypical week. This is a more typical week. Yeah. Um, I have to exit full screen to see my calendar. Wednesday. Wednesday, I 
could do like nine. Um, what the evolution meeting is when? Sorry. Uh, well, right now we remember we switched it to noon on Wednesdays because we we couldn't do the ten on Thursday slot because I am in class. So we switched it, and then we had that one meeting that was uh, last week that was on noon on Wednesday. And then you All mentioned right. yes, or uh, yesterday. Yeah. You mentioned to me that the year so, pushed back on the noon time. Yeah, yeah. So. I'm looking for other times that don't conflict with the auger calendar right now. Um, I have risk every other Monday at nine. What if we alternated it with risk? And I mean, Monday, I think Monday's a suck ass day to have a meeting. Yeah, uh, I'd rather I would rather do it on Wednesdays because on Mondays I don't have class at all. Yeah, so some there's a, there's a chance that I'll like especially later in the semester. There's a couple times I have to go home. I probably won't be here on a Monday. All right. I mean, I I can do it if that's what works, but no, my preference would be Wednesday. Uh, yeah, nine two. All right. Well, let's do it at. Can you do it at nine o'clock on? Uh, let's. Could just do it at nine o'clock on Wednesday. That's fine. Um, evolution. All right, and I'll ask uh, Georg. Uh, I don't have the rights to move this. What about the um, this call? Uh, yeah, okay. Are we keeping this at the same time? We're we going to move this one too. All right. So I did, I did nine o'clock on Wednesdays for evolution. Um, and then going back to your calendar, uh, which I have to make bigger. Right now we have the, so Wednesdays, the, sorry. So 10 o'clock is diversity and inclusion. On uh, Wednesdays? Um, yeah. Uh, but I don't think there's a ton of overlap. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we would like to move the, I think I could just say we'd like to move the auger meeting to um, 10 a.m. on, I don't know, it's just bad form, I guess. Uh, Grimoire Lab really claimed a sweet spot within, with, right before the evolution call, I'll give them that. At 8 o'clock? No, well, no, they're doing, they do the evolution call at their, I'm sorry, the general call is at 11 on Tuesdays and they have their meeting at 10 on Tuesdays. Yeah. Um, and your calendar says, uh, doing it like right after my cloud computing class would be nice because I'm literally, I'm, Right across the hall. Well, from your eleven class. on Tuesday. Oh, so maybe eleven on Thursdays. Let me see what that looks like. Um, eleven on Thursdays actually looks uh, doable. Okay. Is that is that right after your class? Yeah, I get out at ten forty-five, so I could be here. I mean, it's okay. it's in that room right next to your office, so I could just be here immediately after when my class gets out. Cancel. Okay, so I'm gonna actually control one of these meetings, and so I'm gonna move it to. Oh, you said you said 11 a.m. on Thursdays. Yeah. So today's the 19th. 
So next week is perfect. So yeah, okay, okay. I am on the sixth would be the next one. Er, right. Are we doing the auger call every two weeks or every one week? What well, we've been we've been doing it every week, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. In which case it would be on the twenty seventh. Oh. That's true. All right. Good point. Um, Thursdays at 11, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So does that work? Does that work for you, Gabe? Yeah, that works for me. Okay. What's at 11 on Wednesdays? Is that common? 11 on Wednesdays is... Diversity and include. Uh, actually, there's nothing at 11 on Wednesdays. Do you want to do 11 on Wednesdays? Um, That's fine with me. If we do that, then I can't be on them. I'd rather, actually, between those two, since the evolution would be at 9, I, that, having that hour gap would be awkward. That would throw my whole morning in the trash. So, so all right, let's, so Thursday works? So, yeah, that Thursday time, since all of us can meet, and it's right after my class, I'll be on campus anyways. So I think that works better. All right, all right. Here, let me start checking my calendar. Now everybody who watches the video knows when I have class. They know where to find me. So February, all right, so Docker installed 2.0 is February 27th, 2020. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have the repo group stuff yep. or the, not the repo group, the repo management all right. it's all cool. working by then. All right. So um, 11 a.m. on Thursdays, right? Yeah. So then I need to email. Lombard. Well, oh, Georg put the, uh, the Docker compose stuff at the top of the weekly newsletter. Thanks, Georg. We're the first thing you see. All right. So now it's okay. Enough administration for the working group. Let's talk mm -hmm. about Docker and okay. your Docker demo. Okay. Um, we have successfully moved all the things. Yep. And um, okay, so getting on your demo ishness. All right. Can you see my screen? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, that's right. I, I just asked because I my monitor is ultra wide and I forget that sometimes it uh, messes other people's monitors up. Anyways, um, do you want me to start with? Um, do you guys? I'll just do. Start, know start about the, Docker. So I would. I think let's assume that someone has done a Git clone on an Augur instance okay. and set up the virtual environment and now okay. wants to configure. Uh, a Docker container and make it run and put their repos in it. Okay. Is that um, the case we're working on? Sure. Um, you so, tell us. 
exactly the use you want to demonstrate. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my first question is, how familiar are you guys with Docker? I have limited familiarity with Docker. I have used it. I have not done a Docker Compose myself. I have. Okay. We've deployed a lot of Augur instances using Docker, but um, we haven't ever made it clear how to do that on your own. So I would say start from, I've cloned Augur, now what? Okay. Um, so. Your screen twice, but I guess it looks like you have two terminals open. Would, yeah, you know, I'm okay. using a Tmux. Um, All right, making sure I'm not like seeing something. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you're not going crazy. Um, so the use case that we're targeting with the Docker installation is um, not even that you have to have installed Augur or created a virtual environment. The beauty of it is all you have to do um, really is clone Augur so that you can get access to two specific files. Um, those two files being Docker Compose and the database compose.yaml. Um, so essentially what happens when you run the Docker, the Docker commands um, is it starts one container uh, from this Augur Labs Augur latest image. Um, right now it's just pointing to latest, but essentially um, I've built a Augur image. Um, it's just a containerized version of Augur that is to be used as the basis for this container. Um, and then there's some configuration stuff, which is to say, restart it um, always. Like if something errors, restart it. But okay. if somebody manually stops it, then don't restart it. Right. Um, right. And then uh, exposing the default port of 5000 for connections on, um, to be able to connect to it from your local machine if you want to SSH into it or um, hit the endpoints. Um, one thing to do would probably would be to make this more configurable in case port 5000 is taken, but I think for right now it's fine to just hard code it. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think the use case for the Docker container is principally somebody who wants to run it on their local workstation. Yeah. And this should work, but they could edit this. Com yeah. They could edit the ports in the compose file if they, yeah. if they needed to. So this is exactly. different from a non-Docker Docker instance and where you would edit the ports in the augur.config.json. Here we're setting them up in the database compose YAML file. Yeah, so this one's the Docker compose. Oh, sorry. Um, compose, yeah, sorry. I'll get to the database wrong. one. Sorry, sorry, yeah. wrong tab. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing, uh, so we're setting up, these are the ports for the workers. These don't actually necessarily need to be exposed. Um, I don't believe because um, most all, it's all, all it's, inside the machine. It's all inside the machine, but I expose them anyway, just in case um, like you were doing some collection and you wanted to like, rather than like SSHing into the machine or not SSHing, rather than like attaching to the machine and looking at it that way, if you wanted to expose it, you could, if you wanted I, to hit the endpoints directly, you could. Um, yeah, I could start workers on other machines. If, if I really wanted to have a high yeah. scalable Docker solution, I might have five machines running a worker each. And Right, and you can that start would, that those would be all. That would be like if you wanted to recreate GH torrent. <laughs> right, right. In our, in our schema. Right. Um, um, bravo to you if you're doing that. Um, yeah, I'm not. And so then, yeah. <laughs> This line is very important. So uh, this line, uh, so there's this uh, env.txt. Um, I'm going to delete my key really fast. I forgot to do that. Um, so this env.txt is uh, what allows you to configure the um, to configure Augur inside the container at runtime. So the two most important things that pretty much everybody will have um, is this GitHub API key, this Augur GitHub API key, which is exactly what you think it is. And then this facade repo directory is not necessarily um, needed. I think actually I just left it in there. Um, one thing to note actually it's that I was needed. thinking about. Why is it not needed? Uh, so that's what, I'm, I, that's what I'm about to get to. It's kind of hard to explain. Okay. Basically when you run the database container um, alongside Augur, mm -hmm. um, the problem is that the facade worker reads the the facade repo directory from the database, right. but clones them to the Augur container. So if you are running, if you're running it with an external database, um, 
this facade repo directory has to be a path inside Augur, the Augur container. So you have to set that manually in your external database. It's, it's weird how it works. We need to refactor it so that the facade repo directory is always read from the local config so it doesn't have to go read the database because then you get to this weird, like, database is on one machine, Augur is on another machine, but the, re the path for the facade worker is in the database. We can talk about that refactoring later. Is this a... So this is a directory that just needs to exist inside the Docker container, and by default, that directory will be created to clone the repo. Yes. So when you when you run it, um, when you run the database container alongside the Docker container, which is what you would expect most people to do, and that's what yeah. we would encourage because it's the most white, it's the most supported. Um, they don't actually don't have to worry about this. It's already set up in the database. Well, it's um, it, in the database image. Yeah, it certainly makes it easier for people to set up because they don't have to do all the database stuff. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that's going to that's gonna be the main use case. I think few people would run it on a, using a separate database. Right. And then so um, these, these, these ones are only necessary if you're connecting to an external database. Um, okay. And so basically all of these get passed as yeah. environment variables to the Docker okay. container, which is how it's configured, but most people yeah. won't use it like that, so. Right. But we don't, let's, that's not going to be a primary use case for this, I don't think. No, nope. so I'm not worried about it. Um, but uh, if there are other configuration options in the future, they will go in this env.txt file. Um, the most important one for most people, you're probably just going to need your key. Your, but, your key, right. Right. Um, and then this uh, Docker Compose also defines a front-end service, um, which builds from the front-end. Uh, right now, it's only front-end dev. Um, there will be a front end, like actual, like kind of this, fr you know, front end latest. There'll be like a, or a, sorry, it'll be like just a regular front end. I just set up the dash dev for right now. Okay. Um, don't don't worry about that. That's all right. Good stuff. Um, and the same basic thing. Don't restart it unless it stopped, and then expose port 80, uh, 8080, which is the default port. Um, or, sorry, that's the point where Augur is exposed. Um, well, if I went to a web page on my local machine, it would be on 8080. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if I had something there, I would um, go ahead and uh, change. You just, yeah, change the port. Um, okay. Good. And then uh, the other, th uh, the other one, sorry, go ahead. Keep going. Um, so then the other one is the database compose.yaml. And I'll get to why these are in separate files in just a second. Um, so this one defines. That talk to each other and we're using Docker Compose. Um, well, they're actually, they're in, se they're in separate files because um, Docker allows you to specify multiple compose files at runtime and right. it compiles them all together. Mm -hmm. So doing it this way lets you run it, lets you run these without necessarily having to run the database if you want to use your own database that you've okay. already set up. Sure. So okay. that's, that's why they're separate. Um, I don't know if there's a way to do it where it's all in one file, but this way just is so much easier and Docker yeah. supports it. So mm -hmm. that's why it's Better. like that. Um, and all of these uh, is the same. Um, it's the same, except this volumes uh, portion is significant. So volumes persist uh, data between, um, like when you shut down the container and then start it back up, um, right. everything that's in Augur data will be persisted. Okay. And that's where the Postgres, um, stores its uh, data, I believe, right. is in this Augur data. Um, okay. I'll have to double check that, but basically this is the database, this is the back end, this is the front end. All right. um, Got and it. The, way that, the way that you use it is actually su super simple. Um, so actually, okay, I'll do, the, I'll do the raw commands first and then I'll talk about the shortcuts. Um, so in this top one up here, so um, I'm in my directory, I just cloned, um, I've just cloned Augur. Um, I actually don't need to set up my virtual environment. I don't need to install anything. Um, all I've got to do is I have to make sure first that Docker is running on my computer. So up here, Docker desktop is running, so I should be all good to go. So then if I do Docker compose um, dash F for the file, and then I pass it docker compose.yaml, and then I say I've got another file that I want you to use, database dash compose.yaml up dash dash build. Uh, the build is um, just to force it to rebuild in case the images have changed. Um, the images have not changed, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and this up command is actually what's going to start it. Um, 
And then that uh, this dash D parameter is optional. This will run it in the background. Um, stands for detach. So if you wanted to do this and then go on and do other stuff, um, you would run it with dash D. But for the purposes of the demo, I'm just going to keep this in the foreground. And then we can do some other stuff in this terminal down here, if that makes sense. Yep. All right. So I've got this. Um, now, if I um, hadn't, so here, actually, I'll go down to this terminal. Oops. Uh, there we go. Um, so if I go down to this terminal, Docker image ls, um, you'll notice that I have these three um, images already downloaded to my computer. Um, and I actually built them locally to make sure that they were the right versions. But when somebody else is normally going to use Augur, um, the first time they run the Docker container, uh, Docker will go download the images, um, and then it will start. And it'll take a little bit for the images to download, especially because the Augur one is still a gig and a half, um, which I've got to work on. Um, but that's, uh, so that's the first time somebody runs it, they'll have to download it, um, and then it'll start. So actually, you'll see that Augur has already started working up here. Um, Wait, Postgres database directory. Uh, hang on. I forgot to delete the containers that I had already had running. Um, so this Docker compose down, so sorry, I kind of didn't explain that well. I forgot to delete the containers that I had used to test this earlier. Um, and I want to make sure we're doing a completely fresh install, like what it would look like the first time somebody starts it. Um, this Docker compose down is what you use to stop containers and also to uh, remove them after they've been stopped. And this remove orphans flag, as weird as the flag sounds, is actually very important um, because the database is in a different uh, configuration file. Um, it's considered an orphan container in so, in so much as that it's not part of this one, and so it's not a it's not attached to this. So when normally when you when you uh, do Docker compose up. Um, if you forgot the remove orphans flag, it would only stop these two services and it wouldn't stop the database as well. Not super sure why Docker works like that, but it does. Um, so this remove orphans flag, you got to remember to put it in there if you want to stop all three of them. So um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah completely. So uh, I've stopped it and now I've removed it. So now if I do Docker um, container ls, I should see nothing. If I do network ls. Um, I don't see my default network, which is the Augur network. Um, so that just tells me that I actually have deleted them. So now I'm going to run this command again. So, so now we see creating. So Sorry, this, look, this looks. This is going to compose all of my uh, my both of the containers and build them, and then they're going to be running on those ports. And yes. Does it kick off the data collection workers? Yes, so it does kick off the data collection workers automatically. Um, and so if I go to uh, Docker file, um, so right now it's kind of a hack to get the, the repos to load. Um, this this uh, line right here uh, loads the repo sample repo groups and loads the sample repos and then runs Augur. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is that, um, uh, nope, it's Docker. So, um, this config also, um, uh, this will set all of the workers to start automatically when okay. the Docker container starts up. Um, so if we look up here, um, just this a log is just file of all the stuff happening. Yes. So these are the container logs. This is the container log and this is the log output from this command right here. Um, now, usually uh, when you're doing data collection, you're probably going to want to see what's going on inside the workers themselves um, because yeah. those logs don't get output here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Docker PS to list all of my currently running containers. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to copy this. I actually don't think it copied, but it's fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, instead of like SSHing into the container, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute a bash shell in that first container. So now, I'm inside this container that's running up here. So if I wanted to go check on the status of the GitHub worker, say, I could yeah. do CD workers, GitHub worker, and then, you know, cat worker.log. Um, so for this one, I don't have any zero, or I don't have any requests remaining because I was uh, running it in the background, I think. Um, so I just but wait you can, for the 
Yeah, the worker waits for the next requests. And... Right. So, you know, if I wanted to do a different worker, like I could check the facade worker. Oops. All right. So, CV workers, facade worker. Log. So, we can see right here that it's actually working on commits as we speak. Um, and if I tail it, we should see that it's doing it, that it's changing. So, it's going through and updating those commits. Mm -hmm. um, as we're going, and to double check that things are working, I've already got a PG admin window open. If I can, there we go. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to this local database that I've got set up. Um, so this is actually the database that's running in the Docker container right now. Okay. So if I say I want to view the last 100 rows, we can see that there actually are uh, people. Actually, okay. pieces. Of, yes, people are actually getting loaded. Um, if I want to see if I have been, actually, I don't know if I will be in the contributors table yet because it looks like the GitHub worker was running into that key error. Uh, let me check, actually, see if the, actually, let's do this. So, uh, one of the handy commands that we have for checking all of the workers at once, um, is make status. It just prints the last 10 lines from every log file. Um, okay. that's pretty helpful, actually. Yeah, it's really helpful. Um, so yeah, it looks like I have, oh. I have zero requests because I deleted the key from the file because uh, we're being recorded. Um, right. right. So, so, yeah, of course. Trust, yeah, <laughs> trust me, it does actually work. I tested yeah, it earlier. Yeah. Um, no, better not to show your key. I have a yeah. question, Cardi. What's that? Uh, where are the default tasks for the workers defined, and how would a user be able to change that? Um, okay, so it's still going off in auger.config, or? So this is the uh, default config object that's in configure.py. Um, so what it does is it reads, uh, the, so the configuration file, this is part of the changes to auger that I've had to make. But uh, essentially what it allows you to do is this whole mess of ifs and fors, um, essentially what this lets you do is take this default config um, and specify um, what to overwrite it with. So, uh, not, sorry, not to overwrite it with. Um, you can specify what the add like, values to. Yeah. So this database host, um, changing this to the database. Um, and I'll explain that in a second as well. Um, it all, it will only change this line of the database, um, of, of, of this config. So this will read database database instead of database auger, if that makes sense. Yes. So if you needed to, you could drop in a whole other housekeeper block that has specific ones in this docker.config.json. Um, and it, and would, it would work. Container just different than the standard auger.config.json that you have. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. you put it in docker.config instead. Yeah, and so this config file is in uh, util packaging docker auger or sorry, um, it's just in this util packaging Docker and in this docker.config.json um, is where this file lives. And you, um, I, I saw that you had put some documentation together for this. Uh, is some of this specified there or is that still? Yes. Um, so some of the, like the, that stuff about the config is not specified in there. Uh, what's specified is basically you need to set these variables. Um, here's how to start it. Here's what it looks like when it's running. Um, tells you what port, and then basically that you're good to go. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll I probably the config options uh, in a next release of the docs when, before we merge it into master, at least for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and so especially we. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sorry, again. I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, I was just wondering. So does docker.config.json replace auger.config completely so that one auger.config isn't used anymore? No. Um, so what actually happens is if you, so in this uh, on the Let me see if I understand what's happening. Okay. I believe it's using the standard auger.config.json that you are providing in the Docker container and in the, uh, uh, on the uh, docker.config.json you can specify Values within the blocks that you overwrite from the auger app. Exactly. Um, so that's so, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it happens um, actually when uh, so the configuration file is actually still called auger.config.json. Um, so this line right here is what builds um, from that config. Um, 
it is, I guess it is worth noting that if you do want to change this Docker, like this default, these defaults, um, you will need to build the image yourself, um, like rebuild it locally and then run it, um, which I think for, for right now is perfectly okay. Most people will not need to change any of this stuff um, or any of this stuff. Like they'll basically just need the key. Um, so I think that for right now, having to rebuild the image locally is fine. Um, the amount of work it would take to make it so that that's this, all of this stuff was dynamic at runtime would be a lot of work. So for right now, this is just how we have to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if I changed this file and then uh, killed all my containers and then uh, saved this file and then started them up again, then the changes would take effect? So before the changes would take effect, you would have to um, rebuild it, and I will show you how to do that as well. So I actually um, am going to stop the Docker container now because uh, you guys saw it working. Um, and oh, this is going to quit out as well. Um, so sometimes it takes a little minute to stop. But essentially, what you have to do is, oh, God, it takes, it takes forever to quit out. I forgot. Um, is after you make those changes, uh, you have to rebuild the image. And what I mean by that um, is essentially how Docker works is you specify this Docker file. Um, we actually have three of them, one in each of these folders. Um, and each of these uh, Docker files specifies how to build an image. Um, so basically what this says is, here's how to set up the environment, an environment um, so that Augur will run. And it's uh, the image that it's building is this Augur latest image. So in order to get this, in order to get the changes into this image to work when you start up the compose, you have to rebuild the image yourself. Normally, uh, we've got it set up so that when you, every time somebody pushes to dev, um, or it will be once everything is merged in, Every time somebody pushes to dev, all of the containers will get rebuilt automatically. Um, okay. Same thing with master. So we won't ever actually have to go uh, update the containers ourselves. It'll okay. all be just from whenever we make changes. From a user perspective, um, when they change ports, for example, do they have to rebuild their image? If they change, like if they change the ports in here? Or the, yeah, yeah. If you make any change to this file, you have to rebuild the image. And how do you do that? Uh, okay, uh, I was trying to stall for time until this was done so I could show you. Um, okay. So uh, it's, it's kind of a uh, arduous command to write out, um, which is why I'll get to the shortcuts I wrote in a second. Um, but this docker build um, command is how you do it. So the first thing you have to specify is what you want the image to be called. Um, this right. Augur Labs Augur Latest is what actually is specifying. Um, it, this needs to match in this case because that's what I'm calling it here. Um, if I wanted to, I could call this like Augur call test, and then it'll it'll be in a different image, and I'll actually show you how that what it'll look like. So then you have to specify T for um, the T is the tag, the tag name, uh, which is just the name of the image. Okay. Um, so the F is for the file, uh, which is to say that where the Docker file is located. So for Augur, for the deep, for the back end, it's located in util, packaging, Docker, Augur, Docker file. And then the last thing you have to send to the build command is the context for the build. Um, essentially what that means is when all of this is running, um, like for example, um, in these two lines right here, the context um, is, Best way to explain this. So this path, like to this specific file, that's this specific file right here, um, this is relative to the context that you pass to the build command. So because I'm passing it the current directory with a dot, yeah. um, this file is located at, um, is located at um, there. util packaging docker auger. So if I had passed up here, if I had passed util, as my as my context, then this would be packaging dot slash packaging Docker Augur so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for for specific commands, 
it's it defines the root of where you say like copy from my local machine copy from yeah my local machine into the docker container at this location right. um so the context needs to be the, the current working directory the, the the root argo directory because it needs stuff in util it needs persistence schema or it needs to remove these yep. to bring the image size down so um got it and then the so, next thing you specify is app dot ud uwsgi dot any or no up here yeah no um, no in the command line oh the we command line so this is actually the end of the command all right so, so when i do this yeah so now we're going to see that it's actually building um so it's running through each of these stages so right now it's it's run through uh so some of these were cached docker is very nice in that if you run like it, it knows that it, things have not changed. These files have not changed since the last time I built this. So I'm just gonna use the last result. I'm not gonna do it all again. Um, okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to know to do that for installing requirements. So it kind of takes a minute to do that. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna have to sit here for a second while it does that. That's, um, that's an ordinary thing that happens during a regular build though. Yeah, and um, the users will, Probably for the most part, probably not need to be sitting through this because they probably won't change stuff. Um, right. So when this is done, it'll continue to execute. It'll expose. Um, you'll see it run this line. This is the line that actually takes this config and maps it into um, the auger.config on the Docker container. Um, is there any right. way to uh, change those config values any quicker maybe using the environment variables so you don't have to rebuild every time like because for developers they may have to change that file a lot and having to rebuild in between each time may be inconvenient um it or would be yes. add yeah, extra the, environment variables in any way so basically, um, it would require the three of us to sit down and talk about how you would configure the workers entirely from environment variables, or not entirely from environment variables, but um, like in the default auger.config. Oh gosh, I forgot there's credentials in that. Um, I gotta edit that. We gotta edit that part out. Like this stuff um, by default is not, you can't set this stuff from environment variables. It, Augur's not set up to do that right now. So until we add in the ability to set each one of these from environment variables, or even just specific ones, like maybe just the, the like the port and the number of workers, yeah. um, the only way to change it without changing it so that those could be read, the only way to do it would be to reload it, which is, which is a hassle. Um, but I think, I think, it was going to be a lot of extra work to get that to happen, well, to think, get that stuff think, to be read. Yeah. I think the primary use case is for people who just want to run auger, load in a bunch of repos uh, and collect data on them without having to configure a server or have us do it for them. Like just mm -hmm. get, like a community manager has got like 150 repos they're keeping track of. They can just paste that list into a window and, and load the repos. And I don't know if we have the window demo today or if that's something we're gonna do next week where we um. URLs. So we have the the sample of what the UI looked like. The the actual functionality I think does not work yet. Um, okay. But also, uh, Gabe, to your point, I do actually want to get that functionality working so that we can have developers working using Docker. Um, mm -hmm. Would make things a lot easier, especially for people who are using like Windows or something that we don't support or just have had trouble getting it locally. That mm -hmm. would be really really cool. And I I do want to figure that out. I just haven't had time. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think I agree that it's important for for uh, us to come up with some some ways of configuring it for developers a little bit more easy. I think for people to consume a re repository, you know, for people to get data about their repositories, this does a nice job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is Michael's. Uh, this is, I think, actually a couple of days old at this point. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but this was what it looked like last I checked with him. I haven't checked recently. Okay. Um, and I'd asked him to have a, for the pasting of the, I guess he's, to add repos, he's just gonna have a comma separated list of URLs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, again, that's okay, that works. Um, yeah, um, and it's, I think that the, that screenshot was also before he, Max, and I got a chance to call and talk more about it. So 
I think in the um, long run, a larger box that lets you paste in just a repo, a Git URL per line is going to be um, much easier. Yeah, I think actually I did, I did see a version that he showed me. At least it, maybe it might have been before that picture I showed you, but I did see a version where the box was big. That, um, that's, that's really like, I, I know there was, you guys had some discussion. I think that big box where they can paste a bunch of repo links or, or uh, repo groups is, is where they want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, is where we want to be because the, the most common use case I've, I've seen is literally where I'm a community manager and I've got a spreadsheet of all my repo URLs and I just want to be able to copy that column, mm -hmm. paste it in and have it go. Um, it's usually not stored by people in a comma separated way. Right. So, um, that, that'll, that'll get people going faster for the, I think the common community manager use case that, that I think this serves really nicely. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing that's a bit abnormal about the Docker containers that I did want to mention quickly, um, for most users, it probably won't make a big difference, but at least for you guys, I did want to make you aware of it. So if you see these two lines up here, this database host is database and the server is localhost. Yeah. Um, so because of the way that Docker does networking, um, or it's not, sorry, it's not because of the way, it just is the way that Docker does inter-container networking. Um, rather than trying to like reverse engineer like the dynamic IP address of whatever this container is, and then get it to the front end um, so that it knows where to look for it. Um, right. Docker actually just, or like same for the database. Um, uh, this, so this, uh, this host is actually just the name of um, this service, this database. So this actually, this database uh, here redirects to the, the, the IP of Perfect. inside the Docker container of the database. So we right. never have to worry about like trying to figure out what's going on, like or figure out where things are, like where to point yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and then since the files are served statically on the server, I actually don't even know if I need this line anymore. Um, Cause it's served the same way that we serve it normally where it just, it builds it, puts it in the disk and then it's served with Nginx. Um, or wait, no, actually I do think, actually I don't know if, this might actually be able to be localhost or auger. I don't remember if I'm being honest. Yeah, that's okay right now. Um, are, are but it does able, work. Uh, yeah, are you able to show us the, how you access auger on the front end of your machine once you start um, the Docker Yes. Container? Oh, yes, I am. So if I do, hang on. So if I do Docker image ls, just really quick. So you see this auger call test that I built just a second ago. Yeah. Um, so that, so. Uh, so if I had specified Augur Labs Augur colon latest, it would have built to this. Right. But instead, I just I just said Augur call latest, and I didn't specify a tag, and it yeah. built it to that one at the latest tag. So it's people bad. would have to do that, and then they would do they would run it again, and it would come back up. There, and then they would see their changes. If so, that makes sense, those Docker the config changes. That makes sense. Um, Bring it up, and then I have a question before you show us the front end. Okay. Is it coming up right now? It's coming up. Yeah, I got it. Well, you got to wait a second. So while it's coming up, let me ask: uh, the size of some of the containers, like the Auger Labs Auger. Uh, whoa, you just. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hang on. Uh, there it goes. The Auger Labs Auger front end and database dev. Uh, mm -hmm. um, 141 megs, 250 megs, kind of big, but okay. Um, that's, those are the container sizes that will be stored, uh, in, in the Git repository for Augur? Uh, these don't get stored in Git. Okay. Um, these so, actually get stored in, um, so if I go to hub docker.com, um, so Docker hub is where our images are stored. Oh, I got to sign in apparently. Um, so. So the build scripts you're using are actually not pulling out of the Git repository. They are pulling out of the Docker, docker.com um, repository. So uh, right now they're actually pulling from uh, my local. Okay, sorry, let me, that's not true. Let me back up. 
forget what I just said. What's happening um, is they are pulling from that image, this specific image that um, you these, these your, ones right you made, here. You made locally. I built the images locally because the ones that are hosted in the Docker Hub, which is where they would it would pull from if it didn't find anything with this name locally, those uh, ones are out of date um, uh, right, because okay. I haven't merged that stuff back into dev yet. So I built it locally. Um, so it looks locally first, and then it goes to look online to see if I can if it can find it. So if, um, I, already, if I already have a container, I could just start and stop my container, and that that's just it goes how it goes. If it once I once I so once I built my container locally, I have it locally. I don't have to pull it down from Docker. But the first time I pull it down from Docker. Yeah, the first time you'll pull it down from Docker, and that's what most people will do. Like you see this, for example, right here, this tag, um, this Docker tag. So yeah. last updated two hours ago by Augur Labs, um, and this is because I've set up automated builds so that every time, um, like every time, uh, dev uh, dev gets pushed to, um, it will take. Uh, let me actually open the open it, the builds. Um, like every time dev gets pushed to, it will go to look in util packaging Docker database Docker file, um, and it will automatically build the image. It's not turned on because um, this right. actually isn't in dev yet. Yeah. Um, but it will automatically build that, and that's these are what it will pull from. Okay. From for everybody, unless they choose to build it locally, but this is where it'll pull from, and these get updated when we commit stuff. And push once, it. Yeah. So once I have create, once I've collected my data um, into my personal Docker containers, it's going to build from my local Docker container. Yes. And and if um, if if I do a git pull, uh, my local Docker container mm. will remain along with my data. Um, say it again. So if I like, I'm pulling this. Obviously, I'm pulling the Docker. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm cloning Augur. I, mm -hmm. I, I build the Docker container the first time. It saves it locally. If I do a git pull again, is my mm -hmm. Docker container, especially the database one, preserved? Or is it uh, overwritten? And um, It actually has nothing to do with, uh, for the user, it has nothing to do with git. Um, OK. So when they, uh, so if they run it, and then they stop it. And then before um, they run it again, one of us pushes and a new build uh, gets triggered on Docker and is completed. Once that happens, then the next time they start the container, it'll go, oh, I've updated the container in Docker Hub, so I'm going to pull it, the new version down. So um, going to pull a new version down without their data that they've collected? If it's the database, I actually am not sure. We That's a good make, question. We need to make sure that um, we need to have upgrade scripts. Yeah, we migration sure upgrade. We need to make sure the database container um, doesn't get overwritten when people have collected data. Yeah, um, and really, um, so it's kind of so. This is something I kind of wanted to talk about. Also, really quickly. I did notice that when I pulled up the front end, it did give me a cores, something it didn't like, this local host. So I'm going to change this to the auger, to auger so it's pointing to this instead of local host um, okay. to see if that changes it. And um, I actually am using right here, I'm using, a, I wrote some make file shortcuts because I got really tired of writing all of those Docker commands out. Um, so I just wrote some Docker shortcuts um, to build stuff automatically. At the Does the line. Default, if, the, the, if the default auger.config.json contains the front end block, then 0.0.0.0 uh, .0 .0 .0 um, works um, better than localhost. Um, these actually are not running on the same host. They're running on different hosts. So I actually don't think I can do localhost or 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 okay which is why I, I i'm fairly certain that now that i've changed this it'll work i think i was just changing it to localhost because something was being funny yeah. um well, and i was testing would need to be changed um 
Oh, yeah. wait. Oh, you're right. Hang on. You're right. I did change the wrong thing. Um, so I'm stop building. The front end block uh, will, will point to where the front end is going to look for things. So yeah. whatever the way of locally addressing the... Like that. Okay. Um, it is the host. Yeah. Just the host. Let me make sure also really quick, just so I can double check front end. Uh, okay, yeah, should be, <coughs> that should work. That should work. We have, so now I got to build the, now I have, have to build four, the container again locally because I made changes right. to that file. We have about four minutes left. So uh, next week we will have a sort of a end user, less technical explanation of building the Docker container. This lets people see under the hood of kind of how we've done it and deployed it. And, and next week we'll show people how to configure their own Docker instance. Yeah. Um, I did want to mention though, I, I think I started to say this. Um, the Docker generally recommends that you don't use Docker containers for your database, usually just because of the nature that containers are supposed to be stateless. Um, that's just how they are and they do recommend that you set up an external database, but I figured we could tackle that later, especially because if people just want to get up and running fast, this is what we want them to do. Um, if they're going to do a lot of long-term data collection, it might make more sense to uh, set up an external database, um, but I kind of figured that's something we could worry about later. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, yeah, if um, perhaps, Perhaps there is a way to have Docker um, uh, will Docker yeah I think the only I, th I think this is a good way to get people up and running um, it certainly solves uh, an important use case scenario I think if um, if, the, if uh, there isn't a good way to ensure that we preserve uh, the database inside the image, which there may not be, understanding how the Docker basically works, uh, we probably want to have a script that will install. Uh, there may be some pre-install steps, and we then people just still have to install Postgres, but they can get all of our software. Yeah. Running. Um, which I think is a which I think is a very reasonable. I ask, think I trust. Especially if we yeah, yeah, I trust that from a if I'm a community manager and I want to have this uh, thing working um, and be able to make sure my data is all always there, then, then I trust oh. that more than a Docker distro of the database. But I think to get started. This is totally great. I mean, this is awesome. This is fantastic, and I'm excited to talk about how people can use it um, next week. Yeah, I am too. And I actually just also realized I forgot that uh, because they're in different containers, there's actually a different front end dot config. Uh, that yeah. I, this is where I needed to change it, not uh, in the Docker one, which is my right. fault for forgetting that. Um, yeah. It is annoying. That, so that is actually another thing that I wanted to bring up. I know we are at two o'clock, but really quickly, um, because the front end, because the, because the config file is dependency for the front end, um, I basically, I, I, this is the entirety of the R about config that's in the, in, the, in the front end container. It kind of was like, it kind of made my head hurt a little bit. I was like, why is this a dependency? It threw me for a loop. I eventually was just like, oh, I, can I don't need any of the other stuff. I can just hard code this stuff, yeah. but... It was like, uh, that. it felt kind of weird. That yeah. Basically, the front end block exists because the workers talk to the server locally. Uh, and yeah. in some cases, Amazon EC2 being a, a good example, it, uh, they don't let you, the internal host name is different than the external host name. And you can't, you can't configure 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0. Um, or even a split. We, could, we used to be able to do, we could do in a lot of cases, we could just name the server's uh, fully resolvable host name in the server, and then the workers work and the front end works. 
but because the like some in cases like Amazon, the inside the network and outside the network fully qualified domain names are different. Um, we needed that front end block. Um, right. And so we'll, we can talk about that in another call. Um, we are out of time. So I'm going to stop recording. Okay.